I'd like to clarify that my talk is going to be very different from uh, what you've heard so far. And it's a clinician's perspective. Uh, it's also my own personal views. It's got nothing to do with the university or the hospital. And uh, I begin by introducing myself as an academic infectious disease physician. When people ask me what does that mean, and I tell them what it means is that my promotion depends on my research output, uh, my bonus depends on my student evaluation, but I spend most of my time looking after patients. So this is a patient that we looked after, a 39-year-old woman with no past medical history. She came in to us with a week of basically cough, shortness of breath. Uh, she was quite ill, low blood pressure, in respiratory distress. And for those of you who are not familiar with looking at x-rays, basically uh, half of her left lung was full of pus. Uh, she had severe community-acquired pneumonia. She collapsed in the emergency department, had to be resuscitated, was treated with broad-spectrum antibiotics. Um, her initial blood work showed that she had evidence of a bacterial infection, uh, relatively normal kidney and liver function, but she collapsed again once she uh, reached the medical intensive care unit. She had to be placed on a heart lung machine, or what we call uh, extracorporeal uh, life support. Her heart stopped, she needed ventricular fibrillation. Her x-ray got worse, despite what we had uh, been trying to treat her with. And then the lab results came back. It turned out she had H3 influenza, and her blood culture showed that she had a penicillin-resistant pneumococcus. So this is a woman with essentially influenza con complicated by a bacterial uh, pneumonia, which is not an uncommon situation, but ironically, both of these are vaccine preventable. Both pneumococcal, uh, bacteremic pneumococcal pneumonia and influenza have well-established vaccines that are widely available all over the world. This poor woman, though, couldn't be weaned off the ECMO, and one day when we were doing rounds, we realized that she had uh, um, unequal pupils. And basically what that means, when you're on an uh, external heart-lung machine, they have to give you large doses of blood thinner. And unfortunately, she had bled in her brain. So we were in a dilemma. Do we turn off the machine and she dies from pneumonia? Or do we keep the machine going and she dies from bleeding in the brain? In the end, we decided to turn off the machine and she passed away from pneumonia. So that's kind of an extreme case, illustrating that you know, for a long time, we've had severe problems with influenza, with pneumococcal pneumonia, and a lot of other diseases which actually are potentially vaccine preventable. Just a note, for those of you who are concerned about ECMO, ECMO is not terribly dangerous and it occasionally does work. This is a case we wrote up of a young woman who was pregnant, delivered her child. She had uh, H1N1 pneumo uh, influenza pneumonia. Uh, we managed to um, bring the child to her, extubate her, even while she was still on the life support machine. Now, the point which I don't need to tell all of you is that vaccines are currently the only way that a disease has ever been eradicated. Vaccines, though, have stopped epidemics in the past, and this is in spite of fierce contestation. You know, if you think the arguments that are going on right now between the mRNA vaccine advocates and the inactivated vaccine advocates are fierce, those are nothing compared to what uh, we read about with Salk and Sabin arguing about their relative vaccines. And you've got cuttings here where each of them was rubbishing the, the other's vaccine. Now, a lot of people don't realize this, but Singapore was pivotal in the development of the polio vaccine uh, campaigns. And this picture represents a building which is still standing, fortunately. It's the former Kalang Airport, uh, not too far from here. And what it was was people were lining up to get polio vaccine. Um, and this was the Sabin vaccine. Because the polio vaccination effort was a very unique uh, funding approach, as you all know, uh, FDR, the US wartime president, was afflicted with polio. And there were a group of individuals around him uh, he didn't like to talk about it very much, but they launched the March of Dimes, which was like the moonshot program we heard about early on. Essentially, it was a 50, 60-year-old crowdsourcing effort to try and develop polio vaccines. But the effect of that was that they caught the imagination. So Salk uh, and the inactivated polio vaccine actually had the bulk of the support from the United States. At the same time, Sabin developed the oral polio vaccine, um, not too far away from Salk, uh, but he was unable to get support uh, to do his vaccine clinical trials in the United States because they were totally dominated by, uh, by the inactivated vaccine. And interestingly enough, um, and this is in the 
height of the Cold War, again, another interesting uh, um, historical how things never change, um, the Russians actually contributed to some of the clinical studies of the Sabin vaccine. Uh, and this is a telegram uh, from way back from Dr. Chumakov. But it was actually in Singapore where the largest clinical trials of the uh, polio vaccine, uh, were con the oral polio vaccine were conducted. And this is a very interesting approach when you talk about variants, because we were in the middle of a poliovirus 2 outbreak, but the decision was made to give poliovirus 1 vaccine. Uh, and the reason was they didn't want uh, vaccine virus, in those days it was, there was no sequencing, so to try and contaminate the, the, the results of the study, and there was a belief that there would be some degree of cross-protection. So, um, so the uh, authorities here wrote to Dr. Sabin, and he said that as long as they could ensure the biosafety of the, uh, the live attenuated vaccine, he, uh, he was willing to support the studies. And the studies were done all over Singapore. Singapore in the 1950s was nothing like what you see right now. Okay, we had rural villages out in, uh, uh, you know, even this part of the world was, uh, there, was uh, there were chicken farms, there was uh, pig farms, there was all kinds of stuff. And these vaccinators went out into these uh, places which were not the most accessible or um, easy to reach. Um, and the effect was highly, it was highly successful. Uh, polio essentially disappeared over the course of the next two to three years, uh, and this was largely through the use of the uh, oral polio vaccine. There was very close monitoring for vaccine-induced uh, poliomyelitis, and there were relatively few cases that were picked up. Uh, what is interesting is, um, uh, again, in the Tanjung Paga area, there's what's known as the St. Andrews Orthopedic Hospital, which was built for uh, rehabilitation of children who suffered from the consequences of polio and it had to shut down because there was no more polio. So once there's no more polio, there's no more uh, long polio, there's no more long complications or, or, or the effects of that. And so orthopedic surgeons had to do different things, like start doing knee replacements. And of course, that's been immortalized in the uh, uh, Singapore General Hospital Museum where you can hear about that story. The story continues. Polio has, um, even though we have achieved 95% uh, coverage of polio vaccine, uh, in Singapore, um, we continue to do that. We continue to have a very successful childhood vaccination program. And in line with the WHO, we've stopped vaccinating against uh, poliovirus 2 because poliovirus 2 has been considered eradicated worldwide. So Singapore has also moved to a bivalent rather than a trivalent uh, uh, polio vaccine program. And this is uh, downloaded a week ago. They asked me for my slides a week ago from the uh, Stop Polio website. And you can see that there's currently only one country in the last 12 months which has had circulating polio. I thought Pakistan still did, but apparently not in the last 12 months. So there's been wild-type polio circulating in Afghanistan. You've got circulating vaccine-derived polio uh, in other parts of the world as well. Um, there's very good and tight surveillance that goes on even in war-torn areas. You've got the use of wastewater surveillance, acute flaccid paralysis surveillance, and that has been uh, the key. Singapore took a while to get declared polio eradicated, and that was partly because we couldn't find enough cases of Guillain-Barre. So you have to have a certain number of cases of Guillain-Barre before you can, uh, be, they know that you are actually looking for, for polio. And finally, we did, and we managed to achieve the uh, polio eradication. In spite of that, we've had introduced cases of polio. 2006, we had a case of a child who came in from Nigeria. At the time, Nigeria is one of the countries which still had uh, endemic circulating wild-type polio, um, and poliovirus type 1 was identified from her. So there is this con uh, fear of international travel, a spread of not just uh, wild-type polio 1, but also uh, circulating vaccine-derived polio. Um, countries such as China, uh, through their surveillance, have identified uh, multiple uh, isolated cases imported uh, wild-type polio, circulating vaccine-derived polio as well. But the WHO, again, <clears throat> has keep, kept track of this in their polio eradication process. And what is interesting is that the IHR has been amended. Most of us don't realize this, but the IHR, which previously only mandated yellow fever vaccination, has also allowed countries to uh, introduce inactivated polio requirements. And this has been real. Malaysia, uh, in the midst of the COVID-19 pandemic, was able through wastewater surveillance to pick up um, polio cases imported in Sabah. 
and, and a couple of local transmissions which, which forced them to ramp up the vaccination. And fortunately, that was put under control. So the pandemic itself, and I can't run away from it, um, not only has it had an impact on vaccines, but it's also had an impact on regular childhood vaccination, even in a high-income, tightly organized, well-controlled, well-managed uh, country like Singapore. Uh, our pediatric colleagues have reported on, on significant drops in, in childhood vaccination during the circuit breaker um, in 2020. So, so this is a big concern. We want to make sure that, you know, with all this attention on the, the pandemic, that all the other um, uh, vaccines are not neglected. We also have more and more immunocompromised individuals. You've had immunocompromised uh, cases of polio. Um, and then we've had these uh, laboratory escape uh, polio viruses, which have been a big concern in many parts of the world. And that's led to a tightening of regulations. You know, every now and again, we get uh, a letter from the Ministry of Health asking us, do you have any tissues which are potentially contaminated with polio viruses? And we've got to declare them and get them investigated. So the question is, is COVID eradication possible? And I think you've heard this earlier on this morning, uh, based on the fact that there's so many different animals who can be infected with uh, uh, COVID, frankly, I don't think it is uh, possible at all. I was one of those people who, when COVID was first declared a pandemic, thought it was all going to be over in the summer. And I was fooled by the experience of SARS. Because as you know, SARS was declared a global health emergency in March of 2003, and the last cases um, of, the, of that uh, pandemic uh, occurred in, in July and August. So it came, it had a huge impact, and then it disappeared. Uh, one of the reasons why I think uh, SARS was eradicatable was because that it were, there were relatively few countries that were affected. But the second and I think more important reason is that the proximal animal was identified relatively quickly. KYN and colleagues in Hong Kong identified the civet as the intermediate animal by May 2003. And so in January 2004, when there was a resurgence of four cases of SARS in Guangdong, they immediately zoomed in on palm civets, and they found the restaurants where palm civets were being uh, kept. They, they stamped them out, and there was no more SARS in 2004. You just had four sporadic cases. You didn't have a huge outbreak. Unfortunately, that has not happened yet for COVID-19, so, so we're in a, in a fix. Now, I was one of those people who believed that when the vaccines appeared, that was the end. The game was over. We could go back, not wearing masks, no more safe distancing. Um, and uh, the initial results, of course, were, were very, very promising. Unfortunately, the vaccine, while it's effective in preventing severe disease, um, does not appear to be that good at preventing transmission. And this is local data from Singapore, where you can see that vaccinated index cases had the same rate of uh, uh, transmission as unvaccinated index cases in a small study looking at household transmission in Singapore. So, so that is a bit of a concern, and I'm glad to hear that we are looking at vaccine 2.0. Um, the other issue, of course, is waning immunity, and this is the MMWR paper that got a little bit of press recently, where over four months, again, with relatively small uh, numbers, uh, the efficacy drops off uh, and it crosses zero uh, in terms of the mRNA vaccines. So, and even with severity, that's not, it's not an absolute. This is another patient that we looked after, a 57-year-old technician, works on the, uh, the underground line. Um, he was vaccinated twice. Uh, he had two doses in June and in August. He had a history just of diabetes, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, no major uh, uh, complications. He presented with upper respiratory symptoms. He was uh, ART or lateral flow positive. He was initially treated uh, by himself, according to our protocols, but he had difficulty in breathing. He was admitted to another hospital. Um, he had severe difficulty in breathing, and he had to be put on life support as well, and was transferred over to us. Uh, he stayed in our hospital on ECMO. Fortunately, he did well. Uh, he did not have any major complications. He was treated with everything, dexamethasone, remdesivir, tocilizumab. Uh, he had some renal failure. Um, currently, he, this is now about four months out uh, from his illness, and he's in rehabilitation in a rehabilitation hospital. So even though uh, the numbers of severe cases have gone down, you still have individuals who, who get very severe disease, even though they've been double vaccinated. And we are seeing this, um, uh, and so are many other people. Um, the adverse effects are also the concern. And again, um, some of our colleagues who are here have been involved in, in exploring the possibility of uh, antibody-dependent enhancement. 
which has been reported with other coronavirus vaccines. Uh, it's been anticipated. And part of the concern is because, as we know, part of the pathology of COVID-19 has been uh, immune activation. Uh, and that's why drugs such as dexamethasone and some of the immunomodulatory agents seem to be effective. And the reason why that's a concern for clinicians is we remember the first licensed dengue vaccine, highly effective in two of the serotypes, but unfortunately over a period of time with the five-year follow-up, uh, the finding was that for those who were seronegative at the time of uh, vaccination, the disease actually was, the vaccine was actually associated with a higher mortality. And, and so that is something that lives in the minds of, uh, of clinicians too. In Singapore, we were very fortunate the Health Sciences Authority came up with a risk management plan long before the uh, vaccine data were available. And, and they looked at the signal and they suggested that you shouldn't give the dengue vaccine to anyone who couldn't prove that they were uh, seronegative at the time. And that was a barrier because you had to find a specific serology to be done. But that protected us from some of the adverse events. Uh, the other concern obviously with the, COVID, the mRNA vaccines has been the myocarditis risk. The Singapore Armed Forces has done a nice study but they've shown that the rate is about 2.4 per 100,000 vaccinations or one in 30,000, which is, um, is low, but it's not insignificant. Um, the similar data, again, as you know, has come out of Israel. Um, and part of the thing is Singapore is such a tightly regulated place, but we also have um, uh, very easy reporting of vaccine adverse events. So anybody can do that. In fact, we have some of the world's highest rates of vaccine adverse event reporting. And the university hospital, we're very proud of the fact that we have the highest rates of vaccine adverse events in Singapore. And that's thanks to our pharmacists being very conscientious in reporting all these adverse events. And, and as you can see, this is, the, and this is all freely available on the internet, where you can see that these are the, the adverse events reported uh, in, in the last year. We've had uh, things such as febrile seizures, Guillain-Barré, uh, all kinds of uh, adverse events have been reported. And I think the transparent reporting of these adverse events is, has contributed to high vaccination rates, uh, especially amongst the uh, childhood vaccinations. They also need careful analysis to understand why do certain individuals get these events. And of course, the example that comes to mind is the narcolepsy that followed the H1N1 vaccine, which now we know is association with a particular HLA type. So what about children and COVID? As you know, in the past, uh, up to recently, the UK did not vaccinate all children routinely. They originally only vaccinated high-risk children. The FDA has uh, vaccinated uh, children, but the younger children, they're still waiting uh, for more data. Now, they have done the risk-benefit calculation, and when the prevalence is high, the risk of uh, vaccination uh, is outweighed by the benefits. However, when the prevalence of uh, uh, the disease drops, then the risk of vaccination actually uh, exceeds the benefit. And so this is why you know, careful calculation and transparency over this whole thing is important. Now again, we talked about one voice earlier on, and, and I beg to disagree. See, I think that uh, sometimes you need to have more than one voice. And you need to have uh, a reasoned, uh, you know, without getting personal uh, way of thinking about different, uh, especially when the science is, uh, is not yet settled. And an example of this was a smallpox vaccination campaign. And this is an article from uh, the Washington Post describing <clears throat> the two main uh, academic medical centers in Virginia, Virginia Commonwealth University and the University of Virginia. And these are two of the infectious disease physicians I respect the most, uh, Richard Wenzel and Fred Hayden. And both of them had exactly opposite points of view on whether the US should continue with its smallpox vaccination campaign. And the idea is to respectfully hear, hear everybody out and in a measured way, do see what needs to be done. So I personally was vaccinated. I've been vaccinated three times. Uh, and I'm vaccinated mainly because I want to travel. I'm a healthcare worker, and I want the pandemic to end. The problem with vaccines, as you've heard many times today, is equity. And this is not new, unique to COVID. This has been a problem with flu vaccine. Uh, GDP correlates very well with flu vaccination rates. Part of the problem, again, is this whole issue of IP. In the HIV pandemic, you had, uh, you know, the US uh, Senate was arguing that Thailand breaking intellectual property was hazardous to drug development. But then again, you had the anthrax outbreaks. And you know, with anthrax, uh, Bayer was struggling to provide enough uh, Cipro as prophylaxis. And when it hit US Congress, US Congress said, okay, look, we're gonna compulsory license it, intellectual property, we don't care about that. 
So, so it, it, when it affects you, of course, uh, uh, you know, compulsory licensing is a good thing. And again, as you heard from Gagandi, uh, many years ago, vaccines were manufactured in public sector, and they were manufactured to high quality. This is 50 years ago, smallpox vaccine manufacturing, done in a highly effective manner. So I'm running out of time. Uh, the last point I wanted to make was about AMR. So clinicians, we worry about emerging diseases, but day to day we care about AMR, because AMR is something we see on a daily basis. And the reality is there are far more vaccines which have been licensed than antibiotics. There have been attempts to make a Staph aureus vaccine. They haven't succeeded, although now the barrier is very low, so maybe we, we would succeed in the, fu in the future. I was involved in a C. diff vaccine uh, with uh, some of Alain's colleagues. Uh, it didn't work, but at least we tried. So ultimately, we vaccinate so we can stop vaccinating. This is my arm. Uh, Judy Gerberding showed her leg. So I have uh, uh, two sets of uh, uh, smallpox scars, uh, and that's because um, I was vaccinated as an infant, and then when my dad went to Australia for his further studies, uh, Singapore was still endemic, so I had to get a booster dose. So nobody else, when I show this to my students, they have no idea what I'm talking about. Okay? But that's the goal. You know, we vaccinate so we don't have to vaccinate anymore, and then we'll have other things to deal with. And then maybe we've got rid of all the viruses, we can deal with the bacteria and then the fungi. So um, that's it. Thank you.